Welcome back to Autotechnic, and we're back on the restoration of my 1979 Centurion. Today's video, we're not going to be covering any of the rigging or any more mock-up. We're pretty much done with those tasks, and we're going to be shifting our focus to doing quite a bit of touch-up work on the bottom side of the hole in our existing gel coat. All right, this is going to be a bit of a tough one, guys, because although this thing looks incredibly complete and it looks like it's virtually ready to hit the water, it is really a far cry from it. You can clearly see there's no carpet, which I plan to have on there. Really, the big thing that is lacking from keeping this boat to being on the water is A, electrical. I've done nothing for electrical, and I've decided that I'm going to wait and do that on final assembly. Now, although it looks like it's completely assembled back here and there's nothing left to do, if you notice, all that blue painter's tape, that is all there to protect everything, is what you guys can't see is every nut and bolt that's on there that requires a lock washer or a lock nut. I did not put those on. Nothing's really fully torqued. I don't have gaskets on everything. Nothing done to seal up the pump of the back of the boat. Heck, I don't even have an impeller or inducer in that pump. It just has a shaft. It's an empty, empty housing. So it's a long, long ways away from being done. This was always the plan and my intentions because now that it's all done, all my problems are sorted, all my brackets are built, everything's plumbed, I can come back through and do all my final touch-ups, final polishing, and just clean everything up so it's just that much nicer when I put it back together for the final time. So although the boat's fully together and it looks great, all the progress I'm going to make today is going to make it feel like I'm going backwards because I need to take everything out of the boat. I got to fully disassemble this boat because I have it as low as I can on the ground with those jack stands and we need to do a lot of work on the bottom side of the hole. And frankly, I don't need everything in there. I need it all out so I can do the touch up work. And it's really, I'm not a big fan of getting that boat that high up in the air with all that weight into it. So as sad as it is, I need to go through, strip everything out, engine pump, plumbing, all of it needs to come out basically take it back down to a bare hole and that's going to allow us to get the boat up focus on the bottom now i'm going to seize this opportunity while i'm taking everything apart i'm not just going to rip it all apart and throw all the parts to the side i'm going to go through and be very methodical we're going to label our hoses you can see here i have notes that i need to replace that fitting so i'll take care of that stuff now but one of the main things i need to do is i have to go through and measure for a bunch of hardware that i need if you notice back here when i mocked up my hardware for those brackets for the fuel lines, I just have these flat headed tapered bolts in with the nuts and you can see that I have the nuts on there just to take up the length. I need to measure the actual length that I need here. This is a great example. It's bottomed out in that bracket. It's gonna be far too long for my swim step bracket. So I need to measure what size bolts I need for all these back here on the transom so I can get those on order. Same thing for all the hardware for the ride plate. I just have it mocked up, but it's hardware that's not gonna work for what I need to do. So I need to go through and make notes and get a hardware list, all the parts I need to order. I need to get hardware for the loader, for the pump. So there's a lot of small things and little details. I'm doing all that so that way I can just make one order with all the hardware in one shot. I'm not running back and forth from the hardware store. So we're gonna do a really good job of bagging and tagging everything. We're gonna take a really good inventory of everything that I will need to replace hardware wise. And also all the items that we're gonna pull off of this, we're gonna address anything that they need say polishing touch-ups we're gonna take care of all that now so when we set all these parts aside and we ignore them while we finish up the rest of the boat when it's time to come back together and do final assembly we won't have to do any touch-ups and it's going to just be merely assemble the boat and we're ready to rock and roll so with that it's time to set you guys down and start pulling this thing back apart i'm kind of dreading this honestly because i love to come out here and look at this boat and see all the progress we made but in order to make more forward progress we got to take it apart. So let's get after it.
Although a step backwards visually for the grand scheme of things for the project, it is definitely a step forward. You can see everything stripped bare, engines out, pump, all the bracketry, plumbing lines, everything's just bare. And well, I did leave the fuel tanks in and the seats in. That is because I am just simply out of space in the shop for anywhere to store them. They are quite large. And although they are large, they're light. So I left them in the boat for now and um, we'll be fine. We'll be able to move forward and it'll make it a little bit easier for me to work on the shop without tripping over those items. Now I did get the hardware list made for all the nuts and bolts that I need. Um, get all that sorted out. So I'll take care of that and get all that stuff on order and get it on hand and prep for final assembly before we get there. But now that we have everything out of the boat and the boat is light enough basically down to a bare hole again, you can see that I've gotten it as high as I possibly could on the jack stands. And I cheated threw some cinder blocks under the back and that minimized how far I had to extend the jack stands, which made the boat much more stable. And in the front, I just used some of the I-beam and those are the items that I actually had under the boat in the back when I was mocking up the engine to help support all the weight. So just kind of moved everything around and got it nice and high so we can crawl around the bottom, get you guys down there and show you what I'm after and I'll have plenty of working space. So with that being said, let's get under there and I'm going to show you what we need to address. All right, guys, here's the truth of the matter. There's no big one glaring item I need to address on the bottom side of the boat. It's a bunch of small, probably nitpicky things that I want to take care of, why it's off the trailer and why I have access. So... Like I said, if it was just for one of these things, it's hard to justify going through all this work. But when you add up all these little things together and all the repairs from it are going to be essentially the same method and process. So if you group it all together, it makes it worth it to come under here and just get everything as tidied up as much as I can. So with that said, I'll drop you down and show you what we're chasing down here. Um, some of the areas I need to address is like that area where I filled in those holes. You can see that there's raw glass on either side, so I need to patch those up. Uh, the white gel coat I'm not too worried about because no one can see it. And you can obviously see that the boat has an old speed coating on it as well. So over here on the other side, you can see that there's a lot more raw glass sticking out. So we need to address those areas. If we jump back to where the bottom of the keel where I've adapted it for the shoe and ride plate. There's a huge chunk of raw glass where I did a lot of grinding. I'd like to get that sealed up. I don't want any water intrusion. So we can address all that now. Um, much harder to see, but up on the center of the keel, right up by the front jack stand, you can see where it's worn a pretty big strip down into the fiberglass from getting on and, on, on and off the trailer in the beach. And there's a bunch of rash up behind it, so I'd like to get some of that stuff taken care of. Um, stuff right here, there's some deeper grooves and just a little bit of wear and tear and, you know, use really. It's just normal use in the boat getting beat up on. Uh, you can see, I don't know what was going on here. It almost looks like grinder marks, but I don't know. That's weird. So I might see if I can smooth these out or take care of those. And then on this side, particularly on this lifting strake, it is just really beat right on the corner and on the flats. So all this damage is mostly just in the gel coat. It's not up into the glass of the boat. So I kind of figured I have access now. I want to see what I can do to make all this better and improve it although I don't want to go crazy and try to restore the bottom of the side of the boat right now. Looking for a good compromise, kind of economical fix. And economical, we're talking cost and materials, but also time invested. So the first step for anything that we need to do down here is I need to get all this stuff prepped. I'm going to take a Dremel with a carbide bit, knock out any big loose chunks, and then we're going to grab some 80 grit and get everything sanded and prepped. And we'll worry about the speed coat last because by the time I'm done sanding and grinding, the all of that will be gone and then we'll get that cleared out of the way. And then that will have us set up for the next steps.
let's hop down here and I'll get you guys caught up with where we're at on the prep down here and bring you guys up here. So you can see I got everything cleaned, all the speed coats out of the way, and I took the Dream Bowl and my main purpose was to just really go through and be sure that I had this down to a good substrate so that I got any of the loose gel coat that was cracked that all the way off or the broken fiberglass out. And then I came back with some 80 grit, hand sanded it and got everything just kind of scuffed up. I wasn't really worrying about a big bevel on this down here. I'm hoping my plan of attack, I can work around that and save a little bit of time. Unfortunately, these areas, they're deeper than I thought and just gel coat is not gonna be suitable for that repair. We're gonna have to go do something else in order to get that taken care of. A lot of the other stuff is just in the gel coat. It's not very deep. So we'll be able to go with my initial plan of attack on that. You'll notice that I cleaned off all the speed coating right on the center of the keel. I did so once I pretty much established that 98% of all the damage is centered right up here on the keel. So just made it a lot easier on myself. Went through the pain and struggle. They'll get all that wiped off down to a good base. Everything's prepped, cleaned, and wiped down with acetone. So we're ready for the next step, which I'll be taking some vinyl ester resin, a real small amount, and pre-soaking all these areas where I ground out super super light coat of resin only and we're going to let that tack up and that's going to allow us to move on to our next step and the next step that i have planned after i do the fiberglass resin is this fiber filler um, structural fiberglass putty it's almost like a fairing compound we've used this in plenty of other areas on the boat we use it the seat in our stringers we filleted it all the edges with it i've used it in a lot of areas it works really great it's very strong now i can put this on without putting that resin on first but i do like Putting in just a small thin layer of that resin that helps soak into any of the exposed glass to make sure that everything's good and wet. And then once that tacks up, I mix this up and put it on. So without further ado, we're gonna crawl down, get the glass or the resin, I should say, mixed up and on all those areas. We'll let that kick off, come back and get this mix and get all this applied. Now we'll be applying this real thin and with a normal like Bondo scraper. So essentially like the same thing you do with Bondo, I'm gonna run this across the surface and wipe it flush. So this stuff shouldn't be protruding at all, but it will fill those deeper voids. Once all that's on and kicked off, I'll bring you guys back and show you our next steps. So yesterday I was able to get the fiberglass resin on and the fiber filler and get all those small imperfections filled out. Now when I put the fiber filler on I wiped it onto the surface and I used that squeegee and just wiped it across the boat smooth and level so there should be none or very little buildup, you know above the surface of the bottom of the boat where I want it but we still need to come back and get everything prepped. Now one thing worth mentioning is that resin that I used and that fiber filler they're both laminating style products meaning there's no wax additive in either one of them to have them fully cure off. So I did go back and just took some PVA in a bucket with a brush and covered everything up so that way it would be sealed up airtight and fully cured. Now unfortunately I was a little shy on my MEKP and when I say shy I just didn't have enough in to account for the humidity and the temperature of the day so it actually took much longer for everything to cure and kick off than I wanted, so I wasn't able to come back and continue working on the boat, which is unfortunate. You lose a little bit of time, but either way, we're out here today. Everything's fully cured now and ready to go. I've already wiped off all of the PVA from the bottom of the boat, but I'll drop you down under there and show you what we're working with. So we're up here at the front of the boat, up under the bow, and this gives you a good example of what I did and what we have going on. So my main priority up here, say, was filling this big scratch right there. I wasn't worried about these areas. So I ran that fiber filler in that big scratch and then took the squeegee and wiped it over it. So that's where you can see all this fiber filler that got on the gel coat and the surrounding areas. Now, 
that area was sanded with 80 grit so it's technically not a big deal if that fiber filler is there but we don't want that because i'm trying to match everything with that level um specifically all these grooves so we're going to come back and sand all this off and that's theoretically going to you know we'll stop right when we get to the original gel coat and then we'll have that fiber filler in there and everything will be very very close to the same plane so it's really just coming back and getting rid of that re residual also getting everything scuffed up for our next steps so if we kind of scour the boat here you can see where these big chunks where i went and did the same thing so i just got to come back and get all of these things dressed up so it's almost just like a scuff um, we're not doing a ton of sanding we're not removing a ton of material I put everything on as light and minimal as I could, so we will get all that scuffed up and that'll be get us in good position for the next step. Also, I'll take you back to the intake and show you what we did back there. So back here on the intake, you can see that I ran just a little bit more of that poxy putty on this side. As I mentioned, there was a few small low areas. I wasn't totally happy with it. Um, did not run any up here at the front on the leading edge into the intake. So we're going to also come back and address this and get this sanded down and all blended in and get that finalized. And we also have the areas back here where we filled up those gouges. Before we jump into the sanding, I'm going to show you what tool I got to sand these areas because they're such small surface area. I, and with the shape of everything, I wasn't going to be able to effectively get this done with my 5 inch DA. So up to the bench. So as I mentioned, a normal five inch or six inch DA, you're not gonna fit it under there, especially on the um, strakes. There's just not enough surface area there to get that on. And it's gonna be difficult to get everything sanded. So I found this nice little three inch orbital DA on Amazon. It was like $20, perfect little tool for what we need. The fact that it has such a small pad and surface area makes it really easy just to address those areas I want without over sanding other areas. Cause I really wanna preserve as much of the gel coat on the bottom of the coat as possible. We're trying to bring everything up to that surface. It came with all the pads. It actually came with a two inch and a one inch diameter pad as well. I have the three on now and it came with all the sanding discs. Again, I bought it specifically for this job. I'm sure it's gonna come in handy for other jobs down the road. So with that being said, it's time to get geared up, get back into the boat and get everything prepped and ready for the next step. Okay, so we have the bottom side of the boat all prepped, so I have everything sanded down. All that fiber filler is pretty much just flush or just a hair below the surface of that gel coat, which is right where we want it. Sanded basically the entire center of that keel down with some 80 grit, got it nice and scuffed up all the way down. Went back down, blew everything off, and wiped it down with acetone, so we are ready for the next step. Now, fortunately, I had good fill, I guess you could say, with the fiber filler. So I don't really need to go back and put more of that product on. I got all of those really deep areas addressed and at the height that I need. So now we can move into the next step, which is going to be gel coat. So let's talk gel coat here for a second. Now, when I had the boat scanned at Fiberlay and they mixed up all the custom colors that we used in the bilge, I ended up buying two quarts of the beige and I bought one of the brown and one of the orange. I bought four total. And this is a absolute perfect match to the beige on the outside of the boat. I've done a few test areas on it and it would be a great thing to use the touch up the bottom side of this hole because, well, it's going to look 100% perfect and you'd never notice a difference. However, it's unnecessary because it's the bottom side of the boat and no one's going to see it. And on top of that, this stuff was expensive. So getting this custom mixed up, it was about $90 a quart big investment now i was okay making that investment when we did the bilge because i know that i don't have the skill to mix this and make it match 
and I wanted it to be perfect. So I was okay with that. And it just so happened to be that I overshot it and ended up with this extra cork. Now I, the expense is one reason why I don't want to use this on the bottom side of the boat. The other reason is there's still quite a few areas in the exterior of the boat above the water line where there's actually some damage on the boat, especially on the corners on the back where just over the years it's hit the dock, it's hit, hit things that's on the trailer. And I want to get those touched up and corrected eventually down the road. And well, it would really be a crying shame to use the perfect match gel coat that I have on the bottom side of the boat and not have any left over to fix those repairs. So with that being said, this is not an option. We're not going to use it. Since we're not really going to see the gel coat on the bottom side of the boat, I was initially planning on just getting the base white gel coat and tossing it on there and calling it good. However, kind of got to thinking and I saw that they have the pretty inexpensive um, gel coat kits you can buy off Amazon. It comes with some pigments and that is what we have right here. So this is what a marine coat one. Again, another quarter gel coat. It comes as a pure base white gel coat and it comes with five pigments so you can tint it to what you need to do. There's not a chance in hell that I would have ever been to get this mixed up to match the boat. However, my wife happens to be a hairstylist and there's one thing that hairstylists do a lot of and that's dyeing hair. And so she has a very deep understanding of color theory, mixing color. And well, I was able to talk her into it and I figured why not buy the pure white gel coat? It was inexpensive, like $35. We will see if we can tint it here at home and make it match the custom the best that we can. And I'll use this to repair the bottom side of the boat. And A, no one's gonna see it. It's gonna be way better than just using the raw, super bright white gel coat on the bottom of the boat. And it'll be kind of fun. And hopefully maybe she can teach all of us on how to get this stuff mixed up. So it is already mixed up. We did come out here um, a couple nights ago and she whipped it up for me. So I'm gonna jump to that footage right now, give you guys a quick crash course on how she got this mix and what we ended up with, and I'll bring you guys right back. All right, our objective is to take the cheap base pure white gel coat uh -huh. and make it beige, beige. My favorite color. So we can see the beige in there. It looks a lot darker. And the white. So, actually, it'll probably be easier to yeah, show. Yeah, the color will read better on the caps. The back side of the caps. So the color won't change when this cures. So that's the actual color. Which, when you look at the boat... Yeah, it looks dark. ...does not look like the right color. But it is, because this is the same stuff we put in the bilge. Where do we start? Okay. So we're going to start by talking about a little bit of color theory first. So the reason they've given us blue, red, and yellow is because those are primary colors and we can pretty much make any color we want with those three colors. When you talk about color molecularly, blue has the largest molecule and then red and then yellow has the littlest molecule, which means we can add a lot of yellow to this base and we won't get much color shift. But if we add just a tiny little bit of the blue, we'll get a lot of color shift. So we really wanna be careful in how you add your pigments because these don't have any sort of base in, they're just full color. So it doesn't take much, especially when we're not trying to shift the color that much to get to a beige. Now they've made it easy for us and they've added brown, black, and white. When you mix these colors together, you can get this brown. So we kind of don't need those because we're just going for a beige. We might add just a little bit of yellow and maybe a little bit of red, depending on how this dilutes. When you're doing a color that is light, like beige, you want to use a white base. If we were trying to match like the dark brown on the boat, we would want to use a deep base, which is clear. So if you wanted to try and make black out of this by putting all of this pigment in here, you'd get nothing but gray because the white dilutes color. So if we put red, all the red in here, we'd get pink. Makes sense. Yeah. So, so with the brown, this is, will hopefully be all we need to use because we're just trying to dilute this dark brown pigment to the right ratio to get to this beige. So we're, we're gonna start with the brown and see how much it takes to get close to there mm -hmm. and see if we need to shift with the yellow, the red, and the blue. The yeah. hardest thing about this is gonna be getting enough of the white mixed in without it looking swirly and changing as we use the bottle. Yeah, and I forgot to buy a different container to mix it in today. <laughs> So. so luckily this is going on the bottom of the boat. So if it goes wonky, it goes wonky and mm -hmm. it is what it is. 
So we're gonna start with a really small amount, basically because I'm not sure, I don't know this brand, I, I do hair color for a living, so I understand how those pigments work in relation to, to the levels, but with this I have no idea. Uh, so I'm just gonna start with a small, small amount. Luckily they did give us a little bit of white, so in case this doesn't oh. go well. So we're just gonna place this on the tongue depressor. Brought you some gloves too if you want those. Those are for ninnies. I think we're probably using arguably the worst container to mix this with. Oh man, I don't know why. I don't know what's wrong with like a regular quart size container. So this actually gives us a pretty good idea at a really small scale, like how close we're gonna be to that centurion color. So you can see, I don't know if you can catch it on the camera, yep. but the color is actually quite a bit redder mm -hmm. than this. So we're probably gonna need to add some yellow to this to get it anywhere close. I mean, it already made a big difference real quick. Yeah, it doesn't, that's what I'm saying. Like, I yeah, think it went from, the, to see there. from the video that I, I did watch one little cheat video on this and it didn't seem to take that much to, to get a pigment payout, so. A pigment payout? Yeah. Everybody is like, every brand has their own kind of formulation for how strong the pigments are. And who knows with this brand what it what it would take. If I had to take a guess, I'd say the higher quality gel coat paint companies have a higher pigment payoff, so it doesn't take as much to get to the right color. Okay. So we're still pretty white. Mm -hmm. We're probably at like a third. A uh, little bottle? No, a left. There's a third left. So we're oh. two thirds. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay. Oh, wow. So see how much redder it looks? Yeah. But the level, like the lightness of it is. Yes, yeah, like is, now you can really Yeah, it's see. pretty close. Huh. So I'm going to take yellow now. So I'm pretty confident I could have got it up to this point, but at the yellow. <laughs> and I'm trying to use something clean to take the pigment off of the, the skinny stick. So that way I can double dip the skinny stick stick back into the pigment without mm. it getting contaminated. Being contaminated. Yeah. And once again, remember yellow is the smallest of the molecules, so you can be a little bit more heavy handed with it. It looks pink from back here. Yeah, that's red. So, yeah. So another thing we can do, so we're starting with yellow to see if we can get it closer to that yellow. Pink is the same as red and red is kind of canceled out by green. So we've already added yellow into this. So the next step is to add blue and that will help to counteract the pink that you're seeing and try to get us more towards that yellow. Yep, that's why I don't do this. Okay, so this is our third and biggest group. Now, if you needed to mix more than one bottle of this, you would wanna like either keep track by weighing it or putting it in like a syringe or something so you could count how many milliliters that you were doing. Yeah, so you can make it yeah, repeatable. So, yeah. There we go. Okay. Oh, let's not spill that. So 
see how much closer we are now? Yeah, it still looks quite a bit lighter on the... Yeah, it's the lighter, thing. so... Let's try that angle a little bit more of the brown. Yeah, when I first did, like, my test panel spraying gel coat, I just bought white. Uh -huh. And then I bought that red oxide pigment, which was the cheapest pigment they had. I didn't care about the color. Oh, I just needed just to change the color. Yeah, uh-huh. But when I mixed it, I was pretty shocked at how much pigment it did take to make a change. Okay, and now we're going to go for the blue. Once again, blue's biggest molecule, so even tinier amount. There's barely anything. Well, it doesn't want to stick to the there we go. See how much Close. closer we're getting? Yeah. I think we're yellow. I mean, considering it's going on the bottom of the boat. <laughs> it's the only reason I agreed to this. So that the beige for the boat reads almost like green under these lights. I don't know if it's because the the shop towels or because of everything have, else around it. I have it. a small LED type sunlight mm. for detailing. Would yeah. that help you? I mean, it might be interesting just to see. I'll go grab that. Yeah, so can you see how much... Wow, you can still see so much of that red. Beiges are one of the... Beiges and taupes are like two of the hardest colors to match because they incorporate all three of the primary colors and at all different rates. That's why like sometimes if you're painting your walls, a beige might not look the same in the can as it does on the wall because of the light. And then one might look pink and one might look green and a gray might look purple. I have a question. I have an answer. I think through all these videos, I have called this color beige, tan, cream, um, off-white. I've probably called it everything. What is it actually? Um, you know, on the boat, it reads white. And I think that's because there's so much square footage of it. It reads as like a creamy off-white. In If you're looking at it just solely in the lid, I'd say it's a beige 100%. It's like an extra light beige or an off-white, which are kind of the same thing. They tend to cross over. I would never call it tan. It's not tan. Okay. <sighs> well, I got it wrong then. <laughs> How are we feeling? Still needs to be darker? Close. I don't really know how to make it much darker with what I've got here. I guess I could try more brown, but maybe the black? I think that's gonna make it too gray. Getting aggressive with it. Yeah. And jump back to that first dip you took. I know. <laughs> Listen, it's easier to go darker. I tell people this all the time there. It's easy, it's way easier to go darker. When you want to go lighter, I only have this much to correct. So here's the uh, I think a pretty funny sentiment here. Because uh. this boat, growing up with it, I used to absolutely despise all of the colors. Yes. The brown, the off white. Yes. And I thought it was the ugliest thing on earth. Couldn't stand it. And here I am going through all this work and effort to put more of those colors I once thought were <laughs> ugly back onto the boat. Uh, however, I will say that the boat did not used to have any orange accents on it whatsoever. And it had dark, dark brown carpet and interior and it it was not a good look. Yeah. So the, the lighter interior with all the orange and the orange accents have really helped it. And I think it's one of those things where it's so old now, nostalgic, it's cool. I was just going to say, I think you've gotten nostalgic in your old age. That's Whoa. <laughs> so, so far you've only used the blue, the yellow, and most all of the brown. Yep. Still some in there. You used quite a bit of yellow, too. Yeah. It was, I've been adding, when I add more brown, I have to go back and add more yellow because then it turns red again. So, I got to get the, the depth right, and then I can tweak the tone. That's very it's close. Pretty close. Just Getting a little there. bit lighter. Yep. I'm just going to do one more gloop of brown and yellow, and I think that is going to be as close as you're going to get with what you got here. I could have just, for where I'm going to be putting this on, used the pure white of it. I mean, it would have been so blaringly obvious, though. Well, there's like, already some down there where I patched the holes. Uh-huh. And you would shake your head every time you see it, and you'd probably... I hope I don't see the bottom <laughs> side of the boat. Um, and one more bloop of yellow. But yes, if I wouldn't have made the effort to make it match, it would have bothered me. 
I think the effort is the key there. If you hadn't, if you w wouldn't have made the effort, even if it doesn't match completely, at least you know you made the effort. Mm -hmm. Well, you made the effort. <laughs> I've definitely used almost all the yellow at this point. Pretty empty in there. Oof. I wish I had orange. Well, you got red oxide. Uh, I, I mean, I could make orange. That's the beauty of primary colors. Once again, tiny little bit. Looks like you're going for all the yellow you can get. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you're not going to be able to get anything much darker than a beige out of this. Maybe like a medium gray, and that would be using all of the pigment. I think that's about as good as it's going to get for what you've got. That's pretty close. It's pretty close, huh? It's a little bit lighter, but I'm afraid to add any more brown to it. It's going to keep going red. So. Where do you use to counteract the red? Green, which is blue and yellow. So that's kind of the game that I've been playing back and forth. There's a little bit more yellow in there. Well, and it's not going to make it much darker, though. Like, the brown is really the only thing that's going to make it darker. Maybe the black, but the black is just going to make it more gray. So... And it needs to stay it's such a warm color that I don't want to add anymore. So you calling it? Calling it. Well, you estimated 10 minutes. And? 23. 23. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting the pigments to be as sticky as they were to get out. Like, if they wanted to improve the design a little bit, they could make it into, like, dropper bottles. Well, it did come with one dropper lid. What the heck are you going to do with that? Precisely. It's why I didn't even present it yet. Yeah, no. So, if they had them in dropper bottles, like, no, like that fabric could, This could be for the MEK, for the hardener. Oh, yeah. That would probably make the most sense. So. so well, yeah, I think that's going to work. Thank you. You're welcome. I would have never ever succeeded <laughs> well i gotta be good at some things around here you're good at a lot of things <laughs> i would have never succeeded and i would have been highly frustrated and aggravated i am excited to see once it's on the boat and cured and all done how it looks directly next to the yeah. original joe coke yeah we'll see all right well thanks for the lesson on colors thank you you're welcome now you have some sweat equity in the boat too that's right yeah now you <laughs> now you got a little piece of the pie that's right <laughs> All right, guys, I got to say, I was thoroughly impressed with her knowledge on the color theory and also how quickly she got that knocked out. Before we went and did it, I actually asked her how long she thought it was going to take, and she told me 10 minutes. And in my head, I was like, yeah, right, not going to happen. It's going to take us a lot longer than 10 minutes. Well, all in all, it took her 20 minutes to get it mixed up. I would say it's exceptionally close, maybe 80, 90 percent of the way of there to the color that we are shooting the match the problem was on the pigments that they gave us we ran out of the brown is what she needed more of to continue mixing it to get it closer um not a big deal because as i mentioned i wasn't looking for a perfect match a perfect match would be great if we got it but that's fine it's on the bottom side of the boat and we got it as close as we can it's going to serve its purpose and again we're saving 60 bucks on it so i figured why not so we got everything covered. We got our gel coat mixed up. And one thing I will add is this gel coat is waxed. This other gel coat that we use in the bilge, it does not have wax on it. So you can get these kits waxed, unwaxed. I chose to get the waxed one because it's going to be easier for what we're doing here. And I'm going to mix up a small, small amount, maybe an ounce. And I have a small little acid brush and a different stiffer, smaller acid brush. Gel coat will get mixed up and I'm just going to take these acid brushes, dip it in the gel coat and I'm going to essentially apply these to the deeper areas and the areas that need a little bit more filling with the gel coat. Since it's waxed, we won't have to do anything else. We'll let that cure and dry up. Once that dries, we're going to sand those down. I think that's where the small sander is going to come in real handy because I can switch to the two or one inch pad and keep it just on the new gel coat that I've added and keep it off the base of the boat of the existing gel coat so I don't sand into that. And the goal is to bring everything to the flush level surface the best we can on the bottom side of the boat before we go into our final application of gel coat on the bottom side of this keel. So I'm going to get this mixed up and applied. Maybe I'll bring you guys down and show you what it looks like after it's on and cured. 
and then um, we'll just continue working the project and hopefully get this wrapped up here quite quickly. Well, we had a nice break from all this dust for a couple months, but you can see I'm right back into the thick of it. Not my most favorite thing, but necessary evil to get done what we need to do. Last night, I did finish up getting all that gel coat on. I let it cure overnight, and then this morning I was pretty eager to get to it. I just came out here, jumped straight into it, and didn't even grab the camera. And I started working the front section underneath the bow, basically where this beam for my lift goes from there forward. So I'll drop you guys under, and I'll show you what our result is. So you can see the colors just a hair off, um, not too bad. But you can see where I wiped it on, then you can see where I sanded it down and it just filled all these deep gouges. And then where I had those grind marks, or whatever those deeper marks were, it left those areas there. So it's all quite smooth now, and about the same surface level. I need to go back, I don't know if you can see, but I have to finish at the back of the boat. It's pretty jagged back there. Um, quite a bit of work, and also up here, like on these edge, I need to come back and finish that. I only sanded this top edge. There's a pretty big chip on that corner, so I need to address this right here. And as I mentioned, I was just using this little three inch orbital to sand everything down. And then I was jumping over to my six inch DA um, with some 80 grit. And then you can see that I have this really nice foam backing pad on it. And that kept it so it's a nice, smooth, even surface. So all of this is pretty much taken care of. You can see those spots up there. Again, a few small areas to come back and address little fine details. I'm gonna probably finish up the bottom side, work my way back down this keel, get that done, then come back, address all those small areas and evaluate the surface. But I think this is coming out good enough that it's gonna allow me to move into my next plan step. Okay, we got her all sanded down, so let's drop you guys down and take a look at what we're working with. And kind of hard to tell um, here at the light, but I essentially got everything sanded down. I finished up the back edge just like I did up here in the front. I got all these edges taken care of, and actually, if I spin you guys around and get up there, you can see that's where this edge was really, really chewed up and substantially better. Everything's filled in real nicely. Um, there's still a couple low spots. Not going to worry about those. I think I have everything filled up good enough, but you will notice if you look in those areas, there's still a lot of areas where there is raw fiberglass, which I do not want to leave exposed. It's like down here, it's just a thin spot. There's a lot of random areas across the entire section that are just a little thin and need a little bit more gel coat. So my plan is to get an entire coat or maybe two complete coverage of this keel um, I'm probably going to bring it up to where the speed coat ends, probably about right up here. And I'll show you guys. And cover this entire keel with some gel coat. Now, I plan on using a foam roller brush to roll it on. I've never done that before, so I'm eager to see what kind of results I get. But I'm hoping by using that brush to roll it on, it's going to be a smooth enough finish where it's going to be minimal sanding and I can just leave it as is. The reason why I'm stopping up here and not going further forward to address these is because the color mismatch is significant enough that I don't want to run that up there where I'm eventually going to, I'll see it and it's going to bother me. So I'm going to stop it right above up here because all that's going to be speed coated so you'll never see that gel coat and it's not going to be a worry. Once I get that done and see how this works, I may decide to go forward and do this section with some of the color match gel coat that I have. I'm undecided so I'm leaving it there. We're going to stop here, roll it on. 
So I'm not going to try to record because I don't know how well this is going to work and there's a small window to get it done. So I'll get everything mixed up, get it rolled on, and then I'll bring you guys back and show you how well it worked or how bad it did not work. Well, rolling that gel coat on at the foam roller worked way better than I ever thought, and the end result that I got down there turned out really, really nice. So I was using just a small little 4-inch foam roller like so. I will say that the fiberglass resin does kind of affect this foam and it causes it to expand. And you also have a lot of waste. This foam ends up absorbing a lot of resin. And when I was mixing up such a small batch, I was only mixing up, say, four ounces. There was probably at least an ounce in here, and it's really hard to get that out on the boat. So it is wasteful, but the finish that it leaves was excellent, and it did exactly what I needed to do. Now, I did have some other rollers laying around, and I decided to experiment with those. But before we get to that, I will say that I used the foam roller up on the rear section of the keel only, up kind of where the speed coat is going to end. And that result turned out so nice that I actually took the proper Color Max gel coat and I ran that on the forward section of the keel forward up to where I have the jack stand under there. I'll show you real quick. But when I did that, I actually switched to one of these little mohair um, felt rollers. And this one doesn't have the expanding issue that we had with the foam and it doesn't hold nearly as much gel coat in it. So I was able to utilize my product a lot better and get a lot more gel coat on and had a lot better coverage. Although the finish that this leaves is not very nice. It's a very rough coarse finish and I haven't even started sanding yet, but I think it's gonna take a lot more work to get that sanded smooth. Versus the back of the boat where I only use the foam roller, I have already sanded it and it came out super nice. So let's drop you guys down there and show you the two differences. Okay, so I'm just right up under the front of the boat and you can see this section, which we haven't sanded yet. And that's with the proper color matched or the true color matched gel coat. And then down here on the rear section is the area that I rolled on with the foam roller initially. And then I went and sanded it with 150 grit on my DA with that foam backing pad. And it very quickly gave me an excellent finish. Um, very smooth and really got rid of all my problems. Um, I'll see if I can get you guys down here on that back edge where it was really chewed up and you can see Really no damage left. It cleaned everything up very nicely actually in all reality Just a little bit of that scratch is all that remains where it started to get back through that base coat as I was chasing it So that didn't get filled in all the way, but other than that the entire back section is it's set It's dialed and it's ready for more speed coat now up here I did roll one section on with the foam roller to show you the difference. You can clearly see that that nap roller or that mohair roller, it really left a very textured difference or a very big texture. Um, that's pretty aggressive. So we're gonna definitely have to invest more time sanding on that. But over here at the foam, you can see the difference and it's just super minor. So it didn't take very long for me to get that sanded. Um, it was actually pretty easy. It was a matter of minutes, but we were working with that surface. So I now need to get all of this up here done. And like I said, I kind of screwed myself because I have this really orange peely textured surface. Man, it looks like drywall in a house. However, my hope is that it's on so much thicker that I'll have plenty to sand down. And the reason why I really wanted this on thick and had good coverage up here is this is, you know, where your bow rides up onto a beach or onto the front pad on the trailer. And I want to make sure I have plenty of protection there so that way I don't wear through this real quick. So my plan, sand this down like I did the back, although this other section up here won't be speed coated. So I'm going to have to sand this initially starting with 150, then work up through the grits. And well, we're going to get the polisher down here and get this polished and do the best we can to get a nice, good, clean gloss finish. We're not going for per perfection. It's under the boat. If there's some sand scratches, that's fine, but we want it to be glossy and really match the sides of the boat and blend in. So one last big kick. I'm really sick of this dust, but it's time just to get after it, start sanding, and hopefully this comes out like I hope it's going to.
right, got a lot done in the past couple days. Came out here earlier this week, finished all the sanding on the front side of the keel, got that smooth out. Yesterday I came out and I was able to finish polishing it all out, blending it all in, and I was able to complete the speed coating on the boat. Now speaking of speed coating, I'll take you guys over here. And I did not use what is traditional for a speed coat. I actually just used leftover dry molly lube that I had laying around. I had one can was about three quarters and the other one was maybe a half left of these. Um, I had from other projects and so I decided to put that on. After spraying it on the bottom side of the boat and letting this dry, this stuff has the exact same color and characteristics of the existing speed coat that was on there. Um, I did not put on the original speed coat that was on there, so I don't know if it was an actual you know, speed coat product or if it was a dry molly lube like this. Um, I'm not really hoping for any benefits from it for the speed coat, really. I'm only putting it back on there for uniformity. It was already on there. The stuff's a pain to take off. I did my repairs. I wanted it to make it look like those repairs were never done. So we recoated it. That was the only reason. Plus, I had these cans laying around. So it ended up not costing me any extra to do so. I did check, and these cans, um, you can get these for about $15 a can. So it this dry molly lube is substantially cheaper than the actual branded and marketed speed coats. But with that being said, let's go and drop you guys down and show you the finished results down here. And we'll start up at the bow. And from here, I mean, it looks much like nothing ever happened. It's nice and gloss. It's got a color match and you wouldn't really even know that it's all been re-gel coated. And it's looking pretty good. Now we'll say, when I had that issue with all the texture from when I rolled it on with that big nap roller and I went to go sand this down, I would have had to sand down this gel coat quite a bit more to get it perfectly smooth. I decided to stop because I wanted to maximize the amount of product that's on this keel for protection. So with choosing to do so, it left a bunch of like, it looked like little pinholes, little low spots, and there is some lines and imperfections which is fine. I view this whole layer of gel coat down here to be sacrificial. Um, if I ever need to put the trailer up on a beach, I don't want this to be so perfect that I would be stressing out over it. So I still want to be able to use the boat and be practical with it and not have to baby it all the time. So we just left it as is, sanded it down, got it close, polished it out. Again, it's the bottom side. No one will ever notice. So it's looking pretty good. Um, I did pull this jack stand back about two feet and then I was able to crawl up to the front of the bow finished polishing up there blended it in and also just took the opportunity with the boat off the trailer to polish the bottom side and get all the staining and everything cleaned up so we're dialed you can see there's no more bare areas which this was pretty bare all the way along and now it's all watertight and sealed up and with the speed coat not much to look at not much to talk about the bottom side of the boat is black um, however i will slide back and i do want to pay a little attention back here on this edge. This is where I had most of the damage right here on this lifting strake. Right on the corner, there was a lot of big chunks. They were pretty moderately um, into the fiberglass. They were clearly all the way through the gel coat. They weren't structural, but they were there. And that was one of the main things I wanted to chase and get taken care of. That's where we took care of these with the fiber filler, filled them up, sanded them down. Then we gel coated over them blended them all in, sanded it down, and now you can see that it's completely uniform, free of any evidence of any repairs. Uh, you can see up here is where we had those old water picks up, pickups a long time ago that we filled and patched and gel coated over those. So that has us wrapped up here on the bottom side of the boat. Nothing left to do down here. We can call this done and finished and move on to other parts of this build. So I moved into this phase of the build with two main priorities. The first priority was to completely reseal the bottom side of the boat, meaning I did not want any exposed fiberglass on the bottom side. Fiberglass can absorb some water and moisture, so that was really my main priority was water tidying or sealing up the bottom side of the boat. We did get to go a little bit further and address some damage that was down there and get that all straightened out, so I'd say that's an added perk. But the other main priority that we had down here is I wanted it to be economical, both in price and time invested. I mentioned this earlier in the video. You guys have seen what my OCD does when it gets a hold of me. I just run wild with things and I will really grind through a lot of work to make something as perfect as I can. And I didn't want to do that to the bottom side of the boat, honestly. Um, I wanted to make this, I would say, good enough, which is uncharacteristic for me. And it was kind of hard to stop myself to do that. But 
I just didn't want to spend months and months down here fussing with it. No one's ever going to see it. It's going to have zero effect on the function of the boat, and it's just not worthwhile. And I really had to be intentful to prevent myself from just going gung-ho on the boat and just stopping and calling it good enough, which part of me, it still bothers me that it's not perfect, but it's the bottom side, and, well, it's good enough. So a couple more things that I wanted to talk about, and number one is the method. I've made it pretty clear through this whole process that I am no expert on gel coat, and heck, I don't know if this is the proper method to repair the bottom side of the boat. It's what I came up with, it's what I did. Uh, I don't know what would be the industry standard as the acceptable way to handle this, but the way I looked at this was what I did, if it all were to fail, it's no worse off on the bottom side of the boat than it was if I were to do nothing. Let's say all of the gel coat and fiber filler that I put on miraculously falls off while I'm on the lake, the boat's gonna be exactly back to where it was before I even started, so why not give it a shot? And hopefully, you know, I'm confident everything's gonna stay on there, everything's scuffed and prepped really well, so I don't think there'll be a problem with it, but I just wanna be sure that you guys all know that I don't know if that's the right method or not. It's, I use the skills that I know from auto body and from doing all this other gel coat that I did, blended them together, that's the result I came up with. Again, we're in this very minimal amount of money. We bought that cheap $40 uh, quarter gel coat and then I got that mixed up, which we were talking about after the fact that if we would have only say mixed half that quart with the pigments we had, we would have had enough of that pigment to actually get a true color match which would have been fun to see. Um, it was actually fun to watch Erin do it in the first place. I know that she's been very good at color theory and mixing color, but to actually see it in practice and how quick and effective she was with it was very cool to see. Um, pretty awesome skill to have that, well, a skill I'll never have. The last thing I want to talk about is accessibility. Is it justifiable to have this damage that's on the bottom side of your boat and pull your boat off the trailer to do this work that I did? Absolutely not. I think that's absolutely crazy and that's something that I'd never do. I only went into this because the boat is here, super accessible, it's empty, I can get it up, I can work on it and it's not on the trailer. If I had this damage or even the repairs that I did where I ground into the hole for the ride plate and where I did those patches, I could probably reach all that stuff while it was on the trailer. Yeah, it would be a lot harder to work on and work around the bunks in the trailer, but I would give it a go. I would definitely not pull the boat off the trailer to do something as minimal as the stuff that we did under here. But again, can't stress it enough. Just seize an opportunity. I got it here. Why not take advantage? You guys know the deal. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it, give me a comment, even share it. All of those actions really tell the YouTube algorithm that, hey man, this video was cool, this channel's worth it, and that really helps me out quite a bit, and I really appreciate the support. As always, guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.